Oh, and hello, welcome to um, today's uh, lunch study break. My name is Rabbi Dan Ain, and we are here in San Francisco at Congregation Beth Shalom. And over the past few weeks, since the start of 2021, we have been discussing some of the foundational principles uh, of the conservative movement. We've taken a look at some of Solomon Schechter's work. We've taken a look at uh, tradition and change, uh, uh, some of the work of Rabbi Waxman, and we also took a look at Rabbi Harold Kushner's interpretation of Rabbi Waxman's three pillars for the movement. And I just want to give that by way of background because all of that predates this uh, document, which was created in 1990 by the movement. And this is the Pittsburgh platform. We can discuss the Pittsburgh platform, but I'm not going to start with the Pittsburgh platform. Well, you know, maybe I will. The Pittsburgh Platform, November of 1885. This is a formulation of principles that were agreed upon by the Reform Movement, which was convened at the behest of Kaufman Kohler of New York, and it was chaired by Isaac Wise, who was one of the foremost figures in Reform Judaism. And they came to a number of principles here, such as we recognize in every religion an attempt to grasp at the infinite, we recognize in the Bible the record of the consecration of the Jewish people. We recognize the Mosaic legislation as a system of training the Jewish people for its mission. We hold that such laws that regulate diet and purity and dress originated in ages and under the influence of ideas entirely foreign, entirely foreign to our present mental and spiritual state. We recognize in the modern era of universal culture of the heart and intellect, the approaching over the realization of Israel's great messianic hope for the establishment of kingdom and justice of all men. We recognize Judaism as a progressive religion. We believe the soul is immortal. And in the spirit of Moses' law, we strive to regulate the relations between the rich and the poor. And that was a document that was written in 1885. The reason I start with that is because I think there's this history of putting together these grand principle statements uh, that is American, I think, probably. Uh, and in Pittsburgh, they got together a bunch of rabbis who were wanted to challenge the orthodoxy of the day and a traif banquet. Uh, and they put forth this statement of principles and that, you know, it's been evolved. The Pittsburgh platform has been updated in the past 135 years. Um, but the conservative movement had never really done that. And as we've discussed some of the documents from 1885 until 1985, we have seen that, um, you know, there's this tradition and change, yes and no, different ideas, different concepts about what makes up the conservative movement and ultimately what distinguishes the conservative movement from other approaches to Judaism. Okay, so then interestingly for their centennial, the conservative movement decided to put together an amazing body of experts. And so let me go and show you who they've decided to include. So they decided, okay, it's so our centennial year. And what we're gonna do is we're finally going to articulate what the conservative movement stands for, all right? We've been around a hundred years. We haven't put together a statement of principles. Let's do it and let's get all of the relevant bodies of Jewish life involved in this process. The Jewish Theological Seminary, the Rabbinical Assembly, the United Synagogue, the Women's League, Federation for Jewish Men's Club. And that inclusion means that it's not simply just scholarship perspective. It's not simply just rabbinic perspective, but that lay people were involved in the crafting of this. Gary. I think it's important to bridge a gap between those two is that, you know, a, there was one Judaism in America, and then they were the reformists. And the reform platform, as you said, defined reform, but one of the, maybe it's cynical things said those congregations that didn't initially go along with that were those the ones that fixed their minhag in change. And there were four primary congregations that the one I remember most clearly has been a Jeshurun which printed their own Sidor, and therefore they froze in time and they wouldn't go any further. And that was the core of conservative Jews. That then I think there was one in Baltimore, one in Philadelphia, and I'm forgetting the fourth one. 
So that kind of sets the whole mission. And it was interesting. I mean, it got to the point where it was only settled, I think, 10 or 15 years ago. The guy who bought his seat at B'nai Jeshurun when they had fixed the thing, and he said, I permanently bought that seat. You can't now have you know, egalitarian seating with no mechitza because I can't sit there. And I, you sold me a bill of goods. The, the, the New York Appeals Court ruled against him, but um, it was well, only settled like in the last 10 years. That's fascinating. I'm not familiar with that. Well, that's some really interesting history. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And so let's take a look at here. Here's the contents. There's a forward from the chancellor, from the president of the RA, from the international president of the synagogue body, and as well from Dr. Robert Gordis. Uh, okay, God in the world. Here are the sections that they broke up. Um, no USY. I think USY is counted as part of United Synagogue because United Synagogue, USY is United Synagogue Youth. So I think that that, but yes, why there isn't a distinct youth voice in this is an interesting question, Jessica. Here's their breakup in case you're wondering how they're going to break up this document. They're going to focus, they're going to begin with God. Uh, <laughs> they're going to tell us the statement of principles on God, revelation, halakha, the problem of evil, what happens, eschatology. They're going to tell us the statement of principle on uh, the chosenness of the Jewish people, the state of Israel, Israel and diaspora, relationships between other Jews, relationships with non-Jews, tikkun olam, social justice, and of course on women, tefillah, Talmud Torah, Jewish home, and the ideal conservative Jew. And of course, I know what you're thinking. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, so uh, here we get a little bit of an introduction. Here's a little bit of a forward and a little, maybe slightly cheeky from Ismar Shorsh, who's the chancellor. Picasso once remarked about the still lives of Cezanne. If there were not anxiety behind those apples, Cezanne would not be interested in me any more than a Beaujolais. So what makes this first collective statement of principles ever issued by the conservative movement so admirable and intriguing is the tension that lies beneath the surface. He claims that it sparks dispassionate and unequivocal prose. Wow, that's a lot, Ismar. Gives only the faintest inkling of the wide ranging differences in which the idea for a balanced commission of the philosophy of conservative Judaism was born some three years ago. They spent three years working on this. The final product reaffirms not only the will to preserve the unity of the movement, but also the genuine consensus which prevails in its rank. Yet for all the harmony achieved, the document deserves to be treated as a point of departure and not a definitive resolution. All right, so that's a little bit from Shorsh in terms of um, an introduction. And then we have this forward here, which I'm just gonna, I mean, we could go through Cass Abelson's forward if you're interested, by the way, they talk about Anybody interested in how they went through the three years of discussion or do you want to get to the document? Maybe get to the document. We can go back. But basically, they, they had different ways to get opinions and initial drafts of each section. And then there was plenty of discussion and no consensus. You get the idea. Here's a layperson's view. How did that, who wrote the layperson's view? That's Franklin Krutzer. Uh, and here's the introduction. So the commission, the statement and the movement. So there's a little introduction here. Uh, and it says here, the centennial of the JTS is celebrated in 86, 87, has focused the attention on the first 100 years of the history of conservative Judaism on this continent. Not coincidentally, when we entered into 2021, that is 100 years that this community has been going. So I thought it was appropriate time for us to go back and begin to take a look at the foundational principles upon which this community has uh, its upholds. But he says here, actually, here's a little more history for you, Gary. Oh, by the way, if anybody's interested, I can put the document. Here's the whole document. If anybody wants it, there you go. There's the entire document. Download it. You can have it all there. So the centennial of the Jewish Theological Seminary. Okay. Actually, the first hundred years of the history of conservative Judaism on this continent. Actually, the movement had its inception in Germany a half century earlier. In 1845, a meeting of modern rabbis convened in Frankfurt. On the third day, Rabbi Zechariah Frankel left the meeting in protest against the proposed resolution that declared the Hebrew language was not objectively necessary for Jewish worship, but should be retained in deference to the older generation. When in 1857, the Jewish Theological Seminary 
the first modern institution for the training of rabbis was founded in Breslau. Frankel was appointed its rector. In a few years, the institution had become the dominant intellectual, intellectual force of religious life in European Jewry. He called his approach positive historical Judaism. And by this term, he meant that Judaism is the result of a historical process and that its adherents are called upon to take a positive attitude toward the product of this development as we encounter it today. While its opponents, both to the left and the right, challenged him to explicate his philosophy of Judaism more concretely, but he was not drawn into polemics. He had little taste for theology, and so he was not drawn into that battle. And this goes on to say this was largely repeated on American soil. The JTS was founded in 1886, existed for a decade and a half when Schechter is invited over. And then, of course, we get Louis Ginsburg, Alexander Marx, Mordechai Kaplan, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so let's go through this, past this introduction. This is, talks about the 20th century, conservative Let's just go to this last paragraph and then we'll take a look at all the names. The conservative philosophy has been expressed in the lives of conservative Jews for decades. A number of conservative rabbis and lay leaders have also articulated in part and whole or written form as the conservative community matured. However, it increasingly felt the need to have an official statement of principles and it decided to do that in 1985. And maybe when we're done discussing this, we can see if that decisive step was warranted. The official heads of the two arms of the movement, Dr. Cohen, Rabbi Shapiro, they got together. And here is the commission. Look at this distinguished commission of people who served on this. Robert Gordes, Cass Abelson, Elliot Dorf, Neil Gilman, Simon Greenberg, Evelyn Henkind. I mean, look at this name, David Novak, Alex Shapiro, Dr. Miriam Klein Shapiro, Seymour Siegel, Gordon Tucker, Gerson Cohen, Ismar Shorsh, Cass Abelson. I mean, these are the, these is in 1985. Where's Joe Roth? Where's his name? Let me ask his son, Akiva. Uh, he was not on that commission. Well, why is that? He wasn't there at that commission. So I guess so Joe Roth was not a part of that commission at the time. So I guess his deanship had, uh, he was done at the, at the, as the dean of the rabbinical school by that point. So what, I mean, what do you, what, I mean, so what, I mean, what do you think about this first as an attempt? As we need to clarify who we are and what we stand for. We've been hazy for a hundred years. Let's get the best minds together and let's say what we stand on God, the end of the world and women. I mean, I mean, what do you think about that? Would you feel good if we, as a, if I, if I, if I, Rabbi Ain and the best Shalom community got together to put out a statement of principles on these things. I mean, is that, I mean, what, what do we think about that? Ben. Why are you looking at me? Because <laughs> you just switched on your camera. That's oh, okay. I, it seems like a good idea. Sure, why not? What could go wrong? That's right. What I mean, could go wrong? look, I mean, anytime you have design by committee, it's not going to be perfect. It might not end up being that good, but it seems like a worthy goal. So it's a good process, get the people together and articulate to the world who we are. One would imagine that they felt compelled to do this because the heyday of the movement in the 50s and the 60s perhaps was declining by the late 80s. And so in an effort to reinvigorate the movement and articulate what it stood for when perhaps subsisting or existing on the fumes from the past might not have been sufficient. Um, but it's treacherous territory, to say the least. So let's go into it. Where do we want to start? I was going to ask you where everybody might be interested in, in starting with this, but do you want to start with God? Does anyone want to start with God? You want to go right away with God? All right, we just want to start. Let's see. Statement of principles on God. Any idea? Anyone want to guess? I always like to do this when I did Shuvot. Anybody want to guess what they're going to say? Don, you've got a smile on your face. What are they going to say about God? Nobody knows. I like it. Nobody has any idea what this panel is going to come up with. Fantastic. Here's what, let's go into it. We believe in God. There we go. How about that? Four words. Indeed, Judaism cannot be detached from belief in or beliefs about God. Residing always at the heart of our self-understanding as a people, 
and all of Jewish literature and culture. God permeates our language, our law, our conscience, and our lore. From the opening words of Genesis, our Torah and tradition assort that God is one, that he oy, is also the creator, and that his providence extends through human history. Consciousness of God also pervades Jewish creativity and achievements. The sublime moral teachings of the prophets, the compassionate law of the rabbis, the spiritual longings of our liturgists, and the logical analyses of our philosophers all reflect a sense of awe, a desire to experience God in our lives and to do his will. God is the principal figure in the story of the Jews and Judaism. Although one cannot penetrate Jewish experience and consciousness without thinking of and speaking of him, God is also a source of great perplexities and confusions. Doubts and uncertainties about God are inevitable. Indeed, they arose even in the hearts and the minds of biblical heroes such as Abraham, Moses, and Job. The biblical prophets and wisdom teachers, among the greatest masters of rabbinic midrash, and in the writings of renowned Jewish thinkers and poets to the present day. One can live fully and authentically as a Jew without having a single satisfactory answer to such doubts. One cannot, however, live a thoughtful Jewish life without having asked the questions like, does God exist? If so, what sort of being is God? Does God have a plan for the universe? Does God care about me? Does he hear prayer? Does God allow the suffering of the innocent? Every one of these questions and many others has been the subject of discussion and debate among theologians and laypersons alike for a century. The book of Job agonizes over these. The Jewish tradition continually has taught that we must live with faith even when we have no conclusive demonstrations. Conservative Judaism affirms the critical importance of belief in God, but does not specify all of the particulars of that belief. Certainly belief in a Trinitarian God or in a capricious amoral God can never be consistent with Jewish tradition and history. Valid differences in perspectives, however, do exist. Okay, um, that's the first page on God. They go on on God a little bit here. I just want to see, how do you feel so far? Ellen feels good. Ben feels good. Jessica? I'm curious about... Oh. I'm curious about whether this was intended to be a marketing document or a governing document. Oh, good question. Good question. I'm, I know only from my conversations with Rabbi Gilman that this was supposed to be big, that they okay. had every intention of disseminating this far and wide, of putting it in every synagogue, I don't think this, this was not at all meant to be an internal document. This was supposed to be at the hundred years of the movement, their grand statement of who we are. Why do you ask? It, it's not appealing from a marketing perspective. Well, from the perspective of like reinvigorating after the initial boom of the movement, I could see it as a marketing document to sort of like lay out to those who are unfamiliar what the movement stands for, but as a governing document, I could see it ruffling a lot of feathers of established congregations who are like, oh, now you're telling us mm. how it's all supposed to go, even though we've been a flourishing community for however many years. Oh, that's right. They... So yes, this is going to ruffle some feathers in the synagogues. Also, a synagogue gets this document and says, wait a minute, we don't do this. We right. And it's like, it. is there an enforcement are arm? Are doing it wrong? Are we yeah. doing it wrong? Yeah. No, I think that a good question. I, I wonder if that if that was considered. Um, let me go back to the other other thoughts. Other thoughts on, I mean, I see people are okay with this. We like it. I mean, it's a little wordy for my taste. I don't, I mean... It's a little wordy for me. There are a lot of words on the paper, but okay. Everyone seems to be still with them so far. Okay. Also, by the way, if it's parv, I want to, I want to know if you guys think it's too parv too. For many of us, belief in God means faith that a supreme supernatural being exists and has the power to command and control the world through his will. Since God is not like objects that we can readily perceive, this view relies on indirect evidence, grounds for belief in God are many. And okay, they include the testimony of scripture, 
the fact that there is something rather than nothing, the vastness and the orderliness of the universe, experience of miracles, of historic events. Okay, some view the reality of God differently. For them, the existence of God is not a fact that can be checked against evidence. Rather, God's presence is the starting point for our entire view of the world and our place in it. Where is such a God to be found and experienced? He is not a being to whom we can point. He is instead present when we look for meaning in the world, when we work for morality, for justice, and for future redemption. A description of God's nature is not the last line of a logical demonstration. It emerges out of our shared traditions and stories as a community. God is, in this view as well, a presence and a power that transcends us, but his nature is not completely independent of our beliefs and experience. This is a concept of God that is closer to the God of many philosophers and mystics. The two views broadly characterized here have deep roots in the Bible and the rest of the Jewish tradition. They're both well represented in conservative Jewish thought and coexist to this day in our movement. They have, in fact, much in common. In particular, they both insist that the language and concepts traditionally used to speak of God are valid and critical parts of our way of life. Although proponents of both views use metaphors to speak of God, we all affirm the power of traditional terms, such as the kingship and fatherhood of God, to influence our lives in very positive ways. Our liturgy and our study of classical texts reflect that acknowledgement of the power of God in our lives. That there are many questions about God which are not fully answered does not mean that our beliefs on these issues do not matter. On the contrary, they can change the world. For what an individual believes about God will both shape and reflect his or her deepest commitments about life. A belief in the unity of God, for example, creates and reinforces. A belief in the unity of humanity and a commitment to standards of justice and ethics. Similarly, a person who believes in a God who adopts orphans and defends widows and commands us to do likewise will construct a society vastly different from that of a community which glorifies only the autonomy of human beings. God's elusive nature has always given us many options in deciding how we shall conceive of him and how that will affect our lives. The human condition being what it is, some of these, some choices in these matters must inevitably be made in our own fragile world. The tenacious belief in God that has characterized our history since Abraham and Sarah stands as an instruction and an inspiration and continues to call us to pattern our lives after God in whom we believe. Anybody dislike that as the very first section for what it is that our movement stands for? Irene. Not that I dislike, but you used in the beginning in the reading the word faith. Faith? Do you remember saying faith? When was that above? Was that in yeah, the document? It, faith? Yeah, but it was. I'll, I'll scroll up. It was in the beginning. In the introduction. No, 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 no. In the last section you were in, in the beginning you addressed. Is God this or is God that? Yes, 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 yes. I, I, I need to be clarified about the word faith because I was told before that that's not really a, a term of Judaism. Faith is more a term of Christianity. Um, well, that's, well, first of all, the document, let's talk about the name of the document. <clears throat> The name of the document is Emet Ve'emuna. Emet Ve'emuna translates as truth and faith. Truth. And what is emuna? Faith. Oh, it is faith. Wow. And so the, it's the balance between those two. The oh. acknowledgement that there uh, is, I mean, yeah. faith, but faith, I mean, I mean, I don't know what the etymology of the root of faith is versus anything uh -huh. else. So, I, I mean, I could, maybe Akiva does, but I'll get lost in the weeds there a little bit. Well, see, so you're getting involved in a discussion we had when Rabbi Glazer was here who did not like Emunah exactly. as, as exactly. translated as faith. And he was yeah. adamant about that. So, yeah, that, that's what, what was the reason? What was the reason he didn't like it? I, I think it's because to him, 
it was a Christian terminology, or maybe there was more to it, but I don't remember. Yeah. And so I'm just asking more for myself, can, because many times I use the term faith and then I go, oops, maybe I shouldn't use it. Yeah, no, I always use the term faith. I don't have a problem, but I mean, I'm I'm a little fast and loose with using well, Christianized I, American American words towards spirituality. I mean, if, I don't have a problem with that, Gary. If I if I remember, and I think the thing Aaron is reacting to it, it was, and I forget who said it, but Christianity is an act of faith, and Judaism is about action. Uh, well, yeah, so we inst we instantiate our faith. We yeah, and so that's and, and that's why the idea lives. that's the why I, the, the the idea of using emuna has faith. Um, it not that it isn't faith, but it takes on the Christian meaning of faith, which you know is just that rather than the act action part, which is essential to Jewish. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. And it's it's, it's sense. in contradistinction, I ran to, I guess Torah umada. Right, so let's look at Torah Umada, which is the, the why use motto. Torah Umada is Torah and science, all right? Torah and science. And we're gonna combine Torah and science together and that's what we're based on. Here, faith and truth gives a different feeling to it. Faith and truth means we believe, but we're gonna be intellectually honest about that belief. We're going to pursue truth, even to the extent that it challenges our faith, but we're still going to push faith back against truth. I think kind of that's where it's going. Dara, you had a question. It was more of a comment. Yeah. In the section that you just read, the first paragraph said, there are many reasons, uh, there are many evidences for belief in God, and then it goes and lists them. Yeah, and I'll then it said, on the other hand, people believe in God because of, you know, yeah. because yeah, here it, is. it That's informs right. our behavior in the world, et cetera, et cetera. For many so, of us, here it is. For many of us, belief in God means faith, and some view the reality of God differently. Yes. So my reaction to that, and I don't know if it's just idiosyncratic to me, but I felt like the first paragraph was sort of silly. And the second paragraph was spoke more to me, but that may be because of my own beliefs and understanding of God. But I kind of felt like he was sort of arguing against himself in a way. Um, or I guess maybe could be thought of as being very inclusive in the way at the very be end, the beginning, the end of the introduction, it said, yes, we all believe, but our reasons for believing and our way of believing don't have to be the same. And I guess uh, the writers were sort of demonstrating that by saying, okay, some believe because of these evidences and some believe because of these other reasons. I think that's exactly right. But it does create a little bit of dissonance in the reader who's exactly. expecting, that's who's expecting what one thing and is thrown off track in, in a statement of uh, principles. And Jessica notes it, of course, very wishy-washy. Um, Jeff, and then Marsha. Um, going back to the statement they made earlier in the document, um, uh, oh, uh, the I, idea I that a, a capricious or uninvolved God is not, um, is not a, a, an authentic mm -hmm. view, mm -hmm. something of that nature. Is this statement is this merely a position statement of the conservative movement or is this intended in any way as a litmus test? Are they saying if you, if you believe that God exists but is capricious, which by the way, is actually what I believe, um, are they saying that I can't identify as a conservative Jew or are they saying that I'm not part of the Jewish people? So they're saying this, conservative Judaism affirms the critical importance of belief in God, doesn't specify the particulars, if you believe in a Trinitarian God, what's oh, fascinating to me is that what's fascinating to me is that they don't say if you uh, if you're an atheist. So Trinitarian, you know that three is offensive, zero is uh, one and zero any more than one. That's the old joke. How many gods yeah. can you have in Judaism? No more than one. You can have one or you can have zero. It's just interesting that they acknowledge that here. Believe in the Trinity or in a capricious, amoral God. 
So basically, if you believe that God is capricious and amoral, that's not really a consistent view with tradi Jewish tradition or history, and the conservative movement will define God differently. So that's right. Okay, so that's are they right. saying that if I believe that God is capricious and amoral, I'm, I'm... It's not based on anything that comes from our movement or from our history. That's what they want to tell that. So I'm not practicing Judaism or I'm not a Jew? Uh, it's definitely not saying you're not a Jew. It's okay. just saying that that framework doesn't fit into the conservative movement's understanding of the history and the philosophy of Judaism. Uh, that view of God is outside of this movement's understanding. Fred. Oh, sorry. Marsha. Marsha uh, then Fred. Marsha. Wait, Marsha first. Sure, yeah. next? Okay, jumping off from what Jeff I may have been alluding to, um, I'm wondering in this, this description or is where's there room for when bad things happen to good people? Oh, it's there. Well, I got a whole section on it, Marcia. Let's go okay. down, hold on. Oh, Fred, hold your question for one second. So let's go down to- I'll just throw in now before I, because I won't have it, probably won't have a chance to say yeah. what started is that uh, in response to Marcia's question, I, I often say this to rabbis. I don't know if I've said it to you yet. I think your entire profession across the spectrum, everyone from the left-wing modern orthodox on leftward has been infected by Harold Kushnerism. Well, I, uh, I, I definitely think Harold Kushner um, is a large force in this yeah. movement. And I, I think, know he didn't invent that, but- and he, I, No, I think it's Kaplan is actually probably, I'm Kaplan not, is probably predates Kushner and- Yeah, he does, but a I'm lot not- of Kushnerism with it. It's just, Can you clarify for us for the illiterate- Sure, so that, by the way, I apologize. I've been criticized of moving too quickly and people without PhDs and rabbinics have a hard time following this. So if any time anyone needs me to clarify something, please, Jeff, explain I yourself. Just, I, I just want to finish. Um, by the way, uh, Hans Kung said in, in uh, one of his books, I think in the early to mid nineties, he, he talked about Kushner's view of God. I don't remember if he cited him by name, but he said, um, uh, American rabbi, there's a view in, uh, currently in vogue, blah, blah, blah. It is not an authentically biblical view of God. Also, what I was just gonna say a moment ago was, I know Kaplan predated Kushner, but they didn't invent deism certainly, but Kushner took this, he tweaked it. He came up with his own modified form of deism. He came, that's and, correct. I agree and, with you. And, and what right Kushner right did, wrong with the ball. you're right. And what, and what Gilman would say, so Jeff, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you. What Jeff uh, said is what Rabbi Gilman said. Rabbi Gilman said, no book written by a rabbi has sold more copies than when bad things happen to good people. All right, mm -hmm. that was Gilman's line. And uh, Kushner was the most successful Jewish theolog theological statement. It's arguable, but I'll argue it the most successful Jewish theological statement post Shoah. And post Shoah, to say God is omnipotent is really hard. To say God is all powerful and could have stopped the Shoah is just very hard for people. And so this goes very well into my uh, section that Marsha was asking about the problem of evil. So it comes right up here. The existence of evil has always provided the most serious impediment to faith given the enormity of the horror represented by Auschwitz and the threat of nuclear destruction symbolized by Hiroshima, this dilemma has taken on a new terrifying reality in our generation. It's impossible to understand the conservative movement in the last quarter of the 20th century without understanding this impact of the Shoah. Um, and I've spoken about it before. The question of how a just and powerful God could allow the annihilation of so many innocent lives haunts the religious conscience and staggers the imagination. The problem is, Jeff, is that people were very comfortable saying the second temple was destroyed because of Sinat Chinam, because of basic hatred that you guys had amongst each other. And so the temple was destroyed. No one was comfortable. In fact, for good reason, no one could morally say that. You couldn't say the Shoah was called. It's immoral to say that about the Holocaust, in my estimation. And this created a huge theological quandary. So despite centuries of debate, we must realize that no theology can ever justify the mass slaughter of the blameless. This is them sort of validating me saying that it's immoral. To even come up with the theology for the show is immoral. The death of a single child or the seemingly randomness with which natural disaster strikes. The Torah itself reflects the tension between the inscrutability of God's will and God's own assertions that he 
is the author and prime exemplar of morality. Ultimately, we cannot judge God because we cannot discern his workings from beginning to end. A discrepancy will always exist between our finite characterizations of God and his own infinite nature. Although we cannot always reconcile God's acts with our concept of a just God, we can seek to further our understanding of his ways. So then they go into free will. By creating human beings with free will, God of necessity limited God's self with the real possibility of people making the wrong choice when confronted by good and evil, the entire concept of choice is meaningless. So endowing humankind with free will is seen as an act of divine love, which allows for our own integrity and growth, even when those decisions can bring such horror. We must recognize the world's suffering directly results from the misuse of our free will. At times, however, we are confounded and even angered when we cannot discern the purpose of suffering or the warrants of eagle, evil targets. We deny as false and blasphemous the assertion that the Holocaust was the result of its victims' transgressions or of the sins of Jewry as a whole. We reject that. But even when the causes of human evil are traceable to justification of natural disaster, oh, the hurricane hit that area because you know how those people behave there or genetic disease remains a mystery to us. When words fail us, when our understanding cannot grasp the connection between suffering and our deeds, we can still respond with our acts. Tragedy and personal suffering can spur us to new levels of compassion, creativity, healing, and liberation. Surely, Marcia, you agree with that. When caught in the throes of pain, the sufferer can find little comfort in theodicy. Thus, attempts to vindicate God by positing tragedy as a necessary condition of life, or by asserting that evil is either the mere absence of good or the work of an autonomous demonic realm may have some philosophical value, but they cannot alleviate the immediacy and the intensity of the suffering. We all know you never go to a shiva house and explain why someone died, heaven forbid. During moments of travail, we can find solace in God who identifies compassionately with us in our struggles. This is the Kushner. This is the Kushner's language right here explicitly, Jeff, the God who identifies compassionately with us in our struggles. That's Kushner's, the God who cries with us. When the world seems chaotic following bereavement, the traditional blessing, Baruch Dayan HaMet, blessed is the righteous judge and the Kiddush and the Kaddish can provide a sense of stability and order that can be signposts on the road from mourning to consolation while affirming our belief that not all is chance that there is a divine plan, even when we cannot clearly discern its contours. The image of Olam Haba, which is the hereafter or literally the world to come, can offer hope that we will not be abandoned to the grave, that we will not suffer oblivion. Stripped of all, stripped of all illusions of self-sufficiency by the reality of death, we can gain a deeper consciousness of God who caringly grants us the fortitude to endure and the ability to find meaning even in our losses. We maintain our faith in God, whose will it is that good triumph over evil, even if that triumph is experienced only fitfully in historical time. By the way, it sounds a lot also like Dr. King, right? The art, the great uh, arc of righteousness of history bends towards righteousness, but it goes in fits and starts. Humanity can delay God's plan of a world freely united in love and righteousness with him, but it cannot prevent its ultimate fulfillment. Even if the kingdom of God remains a vision of a distant future, we can attain kinship with the divine by restraining our hurtful, self-aggrandizing impulses and by dealing justly and compassionately with one another. Marsha, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Are you satisfied with their formulation? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I sort of think it's the best we can do. Um, there's, I don't think there's going to be any explanation that's going, you know, that's going to totally satisfy. But we have to, but to believe that there's this omnipotent God, and then these terrible things happen, it just doesn't wash well. So you either throw, you either become an atheist and get no goodies from ha having any kind of faith, or you have to have this sense of imperfection here in the whole system of things. 
Yeah, ultimately you have to maybe shrink God. And I think that's what Jeff is responding to. I know Fred's been had his hand raised. Um, is it on this topic or should I go to Ben? Yeah, you know, I, yeah. I, I could chime in. I mean, it's interesting because I was inspired to raise my hand a little while ago and then that, and we, we sort of meandered for a bit, which is good, but it really kind of circled right back in many ways because I think that what we're talking about is belief and faith and all these different things. And to me, you know, we are the people of Yisrael, right? And ultimately what we're talking about here is we're struggling. That's and that's right. what it's all about, is that we are a people that struggles with the whole idea. We question, we think, we doubt, we believe, we have faith, we have all of that. And it could be at any moment in any given time of day that you can go through a, a, a wide variety of, of those feelings. Amen. And those thoughts and those doubts. And so I think me, that the, is really about the document that here, amen. I think the document here is trying to validate that. Um, ben. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to argue with, with the theodicy here because then we'd be here all day. But no, it, but, I mean, come it, on. It, they well, I have, a bigger, I have a bigger problem, which is that this document is now not even internally consistent. Um, in, our in the previous section, it, it painted a, a wide spectrum right, of, theologi of, of theologies that are sort of acceptable That's right. within, within the conservative the, within movement, the balance, right? Correct. If you want to believe in an all-powerful God, creator, cool. If, if you believe God is sort of a priori, that's cool. If you believe God is more a product of our own sort of actions and beliefs, that's also cool, right? But now, all of a sudden, nope, there's actually just one theology that we'll accept, <laughs> right, which is um, uh, um, a, uh, a which priori, is a god, which is a god who doesn't do reward and punishment. Which which is an a priori god who created human beings with free will, yeah. um, but yeah. is perhaps not all all powerful. So somehow we went from a, a, a kind of a big tent theologically um, to essentially a single. Um, theology, which we, I suppose, should adhere to, if if we want to answer ask the question hard of questions. Theodicy. If we, that's right. If we want to ask hard questions, that that's by the way, I and, and I actually, that. it's, it's a, a question that is eas more easily answered in other kinds of theological frameworks, but it chooses not even to explore those. So now I'm, you know, it's it's a little intellectually dishonest, I think, and certainly inconsistent. Wow. Great. What, uh, just a really good point. Thank you. Irene. Uh, what would actually be a satisfying answer to the <laughs> evil question? Uh, because I, I tell you my personal experience. Um, my dad, uh, bless his memory, um, was a survivor of Auschwitz. And uh, and today is International Holocaust Remembrance Day. So tell me about it. Yes. That. And um, his doctor, when he moved to the States to be near us uh, with my mom, um, his doctor said to me one day close to his passing from a heart attack, he said, you know, Irene, um, your dad was in some way lucky to suffer deprivation because his heart would have gone way earlier. It was a complete shock to me to hear that. It was, yes. Did you, ever the, see the, ever, did you ever talk to the doctor again or was that the last conversation you had? And, well, I, I, he's still my doctor. You weren't offended by the, you I was offended? terribly offended by that. Did you say something? You know, I was so shocked at the time that I couldn't speak, but when you take it out of the emotions and he's Jewish, the doctor, by the way, He's even family with the architect of Beshalom. <laughs> but I think what he meant in reality, the as evil as Holocaust was, it helped my dad a little bit from a medical point of view, not emotional and not physical per se, but a certain deprivation of fats and yoch and, you know, the traditional Jewish food may have prolonged his life to some degrees. 
I am, I'm still. Yeah, it's more, I think that's just, I mean, that could be a statement of fact, but I, I, I'd be very hard pressed to place any value uh, on that. That just yes. might be the case, but I wouldn't yes. have any value. Yes, either way around. yes. That's right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Iran. Very yeah. powerful. Um, okay, let's, let's go back to the document. I, I love Ben's last point in terms of the inconsistency and it's very true, right? Very true. As we got down, we started really lovely with this sort of broad notion of God, but then once we had to start defining and answering specific things, we began to compromise or contradict ourselves. So let's go, here's God. Hold on, why don't I just go up here and you tell me which one you wanna pick out next. Which one do we wanna do? We probably have time for one more. Anybody have a preference here? We did the problem of evil. Women, women. Oh, do women. All right, let's go on women. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be that interesting. I think it's going to be fully egalitarian and welcoming. I don't know if there's going to be much controversy here, but let's see. Women, the dignity of every human being has always been central to Judaism. This fundamental premise is derived from the biblical assertions in Genesis 127, 511, that God created humanity, both male and female, in the divine image. By the way, Iran, uh, it's interesting. You mentioned on women, think about what they'd have to put in this section today. Like here, right? You could have men and women and you could address with this section, think about how they might have to frame it differently 30 years later. Um, the equality of the sexes is explicitly affirmed in the conservative prayer book in the blessing in which both men and women thank God for having been created in his image. Access to Jewish education for women has been a hallmark of conservative Judaism since the days, I, I, by the way, I thought this would be nice. I, I think I, I don't love access to Jewish education as a hallmark that, that I'm not a woman, but I, that seems patronizing, has been a hallmark of conservative Judaism since the days of Solomon Schechter. In almost all our synagogues, men and women are seated together in almost all interesting. The bat mitzvah ceremony now celebrated in virtually all synagogues was originated in the conservative movement by Mordechai Kaplan. Over the years, our movement has encouraged women to assume roles of communal service and leadership, both in professional and lay capacity. In recent days, the discussion of the role of women has rekindled interest in some quarters in areas as diverse as Taharat Mishpacha, which is the system of family purity revolving around the use of the mikvah, which is our ritual bath. The creation of naming ceremonies, Simchat Bat for girls, and a special women's observance for Rosh Chodesh. We are convinced that justice and dignity for each human being can be achieved within the framework of halakha, thus obviating the inequalities which lead to situations like that of agunot, which is when women who cannot remarry without their husbands initiating a divorce. After years of research and trial by the CJLS, the conservative movement has provided satisfactory practical solutions to the many naughty problems in this area. So this is an acknowledgement that they're naughty problems with halakha, but we can work with those. There is a wide spectrum of opinion within our movement with regard to the role of women in Jewish ritual. Here's that wide spectrum of opinion again. Many believe that women should assume the full rights and responsibilities of ritual participation, including serving as rabbis and cantors. Indeed, JTS now ordains women as rabbis and certifies them as cantors, and the RA accepts them as members. But on the other hand, many within the movement believe that women today can find religious fulfillment in the context of traditional practice. All the various views of the specifics of women's roles and rights, except lechatchila, that's not an, that should be an L, I think, as the governing framework for Jewish life. All right, so what, do you, what did you think of that, Iran? You like that? I think if it, they say what they say and they believe it, I think that's good. Does it? Do you like that? Do you feel included? Sandy Edwards is shaking her head no. Sandy Edwards, you got to speak up here. You can't shake your head no so loudly like that and not say anything. Well, I... Uh, hold on, wait, hold on one second. I got to mute. Yeah, go, say again. So, I think they're saying what's what's right but it still smacks of women have to figure ways around halaha it isn't like 
they're being embraced. Um, yeah. You know, and so yeah, so as a woman, as a Jewish leader, you don't. You, you, this isn't the language you would support. So, by the way, you were the president of the shul, so it's not within the realm of outside of the realm of possibility that you would be on such a committee. Uh, and this was language that you would say makes women feel. It's still second class. Second class. Okay, yeah. Akiva. Uh, yeah, I think it has to be noted that in the introduction and really in the entire document, it doesn't actually indicate that one of the reasons the commission was founded was it was right after women ordination and they were very much afraid that the entire conservative movement would split apart. So that's why this document in many places, it said, some of us on the committee say X, some say Y. Okay. And the truth of the matter is, well, I, certainly, I live and breathe pluralism. Um, to a certain extent, pluralism on many of these subjects over here, this sort of was a document to try to keep the movement together. And indeed, a handful of the people on the commission within two years of the publishing of this were gone from the conservative movement, never to return again. And they um, went here. And they went here, right? Uh, actually, David Novak is yeah. the current president. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned that. David Novak is the president of the Union of Traditional Judaism. There he but is, right there. his own daughter, his own daughter he is- just got smicha, I know. Of Yeshivat know. Maharat, and, and goes by the title rabbi. So David Novak, you can find it online, gave a very interesting thing of, how he has come full circle on the issue of women ordination. And not only is he supportive of his daughter, but of all others. And I would say if this document were being written today, it would not be written on some say this, some say why, it would be fully egalitarian. I thank you for that history. That's so good, Akiva. Um, uh, that's exactly right. This was an attempt to keep the movement together. And as Akiva noted, it didn't succeed because you have Novak, you have a Livni here, Miriam Klein Shapiro. These are people who are on that list of people that I read at the top. So they left. Um, and this was an effort. And I do agree with Akiva. If written now, 30 years later, it would definitely, Sandy, read much differently. Okay. I have Gary and then I have Jessica and then I have Iran. Uh, I've been relatively quiet because I read this document previously and I know what it said and Akiva is right on every section is wishy-washy. I mean, there's nothing. You read every section and it sounds good and it comes to the conclusion at the end, we can all just get along. <laughs> it, uh, I did a, a reading of, of all the major, uh, uh, a group of major books on conservative Judaism and its growth. I started it about five years ago. And I think this was one of the worst because it didn't do anything. Um, so I mean, I mean, it really, I mean, the, the interesting thing is, and it's one which you have much, which maybe, which we've never discussed really. I know you're you're not a fan of, but the more recent teshuva on women and the necessity of yes, yes, mitzvot, the obligation, in, in, yeah. the obligation of all mitzvot that men are obligated in, women are obligated in. And also the discomfort, you know, we follow that, you know, if you're going to be a shots during the week, you have to lay to fill in. You have to take on that honor. You have to take on the, the obligation of laying to fill in to be a leader of the congregation during the week. So that, that would be a discussion topic. That would be two, respo two responses to that. And I think Rabbi uh, Roth, Akiva's father, dealt with them rather astutely in his landmark teshuva. The difference with your laying to fill in to be the shots is that woman has taken on the chiyuv onto herself, which Rabbi Roth gave her the option to do, which could provide for her to become a rabbi. Um, the problem that I have with the recent tshuva, it's creating a chiyuv where none previously existed. And, you know, my reading of the Torah says you shouldn't uh, expand these laws to the left or to the right. So that's kind of an expansion. Um, I would argue that it, you know, yeah, you can, yeah. that we all want to grow. It's the it's the uh, the idea that we should all grow in mitzvot and all grow in Torah. And when you do, when you take that path, 
that's the natural that's the natural conclusion yeah i mean i i hear you i encourage every well we require every bat mitzvah so every bomb we're doing all of our bat chiyuv. Thank you. Good question. Chiyuv is an obligation. Good question. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I require every bat mitzvah when she becomes a bat mitzvah to lay tefillin, especially if she's having a bat mitzvah not on Shabbos. Uh, in fact, in particular, if she is. So uh, that is part of what I do. But for me to go, and I've mentioned this to you, so you know the example. For me to go and tell my mom that she has to lay tefillin is a step too far when she's lived 74 years without that obligation. I just don't know how I do that. And that's that's where, yeah. I, that's where I come out on. That's and different. That's different than is what it? it says. Yeah, is because it? we're saying if you, uh, she as a, as a woman in Judaism, she wouldn't have led services during the week either. So if she's gonna grow in that mitzvah and be the shots and represent the, the tzibor for the community, I mean, you know, she's she's gotta grow in the mitzvah. Right, but I can tell Ben Chin he should be a minion laying to fill in because it's his chiyu of his obligation to do so. I can't tell that to Sandra Cohen. By the way, that might make me old fashioned. So I just want to acknowledge that. That's the one way in which I might not be totally egalitarian, which is weird. And I acknowledge the inconsistency. No, you but, for me to come, but for like me that. to, <laughs> but for me to command Sandra to lay to fillin when in her life previously she has never had that obligation, and for me to institute it upon her, it just makes me slightly uncomfortable. Sandra, well, I I was brought up Orthodox in an Orthodox family, an Orthodox community, and so the role of women uh, was different. Uh, we didn't have that that obligation. My mother didn't like to film. I mean, she she did the things of Jewish women. She kept kosher, uh, you know, all the all the Sabbath candles, all the all the obligations. But yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm following my family minhag. And ultimately, Gary, that's 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 where I have. Yeah, you know, but my right. point was not for her to attend services. For her to lead services was just not something a woman would have ever done previously. You're asking for them to get to expand their, um, you know, without. I would love for Sandra to lead Shachrit and for her to learn how to lead Shachrit and for me to teach her how to lay to fill and to lead Shachrit. It's just not her obligation. Right. And that's, right. But that's my point. If you, my point was for you to take on the, rep, the ability to lead the service. To, oh, to be have that everyone you know, and that we're honor. so we're fully egalitarian them, everyone right uh, by the way i also want to note i don't really tell it to men either so it, i understand i mean it's i'm not often telling men what they should and shouldn't do even though i might have halachic um sort of integrity as the rabbi behind me it's not it's not usually my practice uh iren i I, I cannot believe that I am so um, naive that the interpretation of the document regarding women had no opening for women to be the equal. Is it really all that bad that it only wanted to keep the movement together? Was there not a little bit of invitation for women? And having said that, I'm just thinking that these kind of changes take years. So you can't expect it in 2020 to suddenly open it up completely. Maybe it's the step in the right direction. And that's what I was hoping for. Um, uh, I, um, that's right. And so, uh, so on this point, I, I, I'm not gonna show this, although I wouldn't mind showing it. This comes from my father's television show. I've shown it to some of you previously. It's the heart of the debate that's going on here in terms of women's rights. It's Rabbi Amy Alberg, who was the first woman ordained by the movement, debating Dr. Miriam Klein Shapiro, Isaac Klein's daughter, who left to go to UTJ, which I just showed on my father's television show 35 years ago. Watch it because you get to the, it gets to the heart of the problem. Rabbi Eilberg says, I wanna do what I wanna do. I want a full equality with the men. I don't know what the problem is. And Dr. Klein Shapiro is saying, these feminine rituals that have been a part of my family's tradition in terms of taking care of the family, taking care of the home, not obligating me 
uh, to late to fill in, actually teach me and my family a lot about what it means to be a woman through a traditional Jewish context, which I still find meaningful. And I don't want to throw that out. And so that's the argument. And so the document is trying to collect both and hold them together. Jessica. Yeah, I just wanted to add that, as others have said, I think the document, granted 30 years old, has like gaping loopholes to not <laughs> include women. <laughs> <laughs> There's like, you could really go both ways reading it. Well, the he, the he is the worst right. part. I remember, oh boy. And I think that document, and I expect more modern ones as well, still frame it as a like gracious bestowing upon women that they get a seat at the table, which is inherently signaling that we could take it away too, which is Beautiful. not the right. That's right. That's right. right. We're very clever with how we've arranged this halachically right. to conclude you, but something could happen. I guess it right. might not be able to. That's right. Totally, as Sandy said, creates second class citizenship yeah. a priori. Uh, and on the, on the, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, Jessica. I was going to no, say continue. on the, on the like, obligation of to fill in point, uh, <laughs> it's, it's like, I think men and women should have equal rights to shirk their responsibilities. <laughs> there you go, there you go. All we right, should both be go. able to, to <laughs> flake on that. I'm not gonna argue that at all. Thank you, Jessica. Dara. Um, much as Jessica said, I, you know, I got that feeling of like a grace, uh, gracious bestowal, especially with the word Indeed, yes, even we are throwing you a bone and the, we are ordaining women rabbis, indeed. And I just, um, the tone of it was so uh, condescending. It, it, it is, and I try to believe it wasn't in its time. That's what I try to believe. That in its time, they had really moved mountains and they had considered them having moved mountains. And this is indeed, we've even done all of this and had felt good about it and maybe for good reason. But in now it doesn't sound great. Um, okay, so I have Iran, I have Gary, I've heard from them plenty. What do you guys wanna say? Oh, Sandra, Sandra first. There was a section on the Jewish home so how, how, if women had all these obligations uh, similar to me, how would you have a Jewish home? Um, I think the obligations would have to be egalitarian uh, in the <laughs> Jewish home, as, is, is what I would say. But Dr. Klein Shapiro wants to say, you know what, who are we kidding? There's a role of a mother. And if we deny the role of the mother, we lose an aspect of Judaism that we don't want to lose. And that's Dr. Shapiro, Khan Shapiro. So, I mean, that, that, and Sandra, I think you might be slightly sympathetic having grown up in an Orthodox environment to that perspective. Am I right or am I wrong? Well, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic because I understand the value of uh, women's work in the home yeah. and bringing up children. And we have a, get our lineage from our mothers, from, from women. Uh, they were the ones who, who uh, uh, brought us up, were closest to us. And and um, in view, and, and and you wouldn't love it if someone said that those are uh, antiquated anachronistic values that are currently immoral. That wouldn't that wouldn't go oh. over so well. Yeah, oh. and I think ultimately that sits at the heart. That sits at the heart of of where I am uh, as well. So I'm going to stop here and let me um, pause here. Do wait before I pause. Do we want to pick this up next week or something different? Okay, something different. All right, so we're going to do something different next week and continue learning it. I hope you've enjoyed our Emed Emuna and subscribe to our YouTube channel because we upload all of these classes uh, all the time. All right, Rabbi Ain, are you familiar with a 